want to talk about economic justice because that's the centerpiece of this whole political debate. In fact, it's the core value of the Democratic Party. Fairness, right? Here's Obama. People should pay their fair share. Now, I agree, people should pay their fair share, but here we are on a college campus and it's very reasonable to ask, what does that actually mean? Obviously, if you, you start with Plato's Republic, you realize that people have different definitions of fairness. So simply to say people should pay their fair share is hardly to sort out the question of what their fair share actually is. And you notice that the people who are always talking about the fair share never do. In other words, it's all right to be a liberal, but you should always think about the question, if I'm a liberal, in what society would I be a conservative? In other words, the, ta the top tax rate now is about 39%. That's the top federal rate. And you say, well, it's way too low. All these rich people are paying way too little. They should actually pay more. I want the tax rate to go up. But then I have a right to say to you, well, to what point? At what point do you think that the guy who makes a million dollars a year is paying enough? Would you, would you say that at 50% you'll be satisfied and you'll stop asking for more tax increases because we have now reached the fair share point? Notice that the progressives never do that. Their idea is more, more, and more, but without ever specifying what that fair point is. And I would submit that there's a reason for this. And the reason for this ultimately is that what's really going on is not any authentic examination of the moral justice of capitalism or injustice. Let's, let's try to tackle this problem if we can, from the root level. And from the root level, I mean from the most basic sense of the thing. So here we are in a room. Let's say we are a political community. And all of us, let's say 200 of us, so let's make it 100 to be simple. 100 of us each have $10. Total equality. We all have 10 bucks. Now, one of us, this guy right here, decides to write a book. Let's call it the Adventures of Harry Potter. And he writes the book and he offers it for sale for $2. And not all of us go for it, but many of us do. Half of us say, all right, we like this idea. Here's two bucks. Let's have a copy of your book. So that's 50 guys who've come up with $2. So he now has $110. Why? 50 times two, that's 100 plus his original 10. He has $110. Meanwhile, a whole bunch of us have gone down from $10 to 8 So you now have the $8 people, the $10 people, and then the one percenter right here who actually has the $110. A lot of inequality has now been generated. But where is the injustice? In other words, who's been cheated? Who's been deprived of their fair share? No one, as far as I can see, because we all voluntarily parted with our two bucks. Nobody forced us, nobody put a gun to our head. So where is the injustice? Why is it the case that inequality per se, per se, is unjust? Now, I grant that we are living today in a time of, well, the economist Schumpeter called it a gale of creative destruction. Capitalism goes through these phases, and they usually are phases of technological upheaval. The whole economy appears to be in flux, and there's a kind of vertigo that comes with that. The last time that happened was in the early 20th century. Most Americans lived on farms. And so a huge transition in which suddenly a small number of farmers, 5%, could feed not only the whole country, but pretty much the whole world. So what happens to all the other guys who worked on farms? What do you say to them? How do you protect their jobs? Actually, America did not protect their jobs. We have some token farm subsidies, but the basic message to those guys was, you gotta get off the farm. You actually gotta get up and go do something else. And so Americans, a little hardier in those days than now, did that, did that. But you might say, well, wait a minute. Well, well why is it the case that these entrepreneurs, these CEOs, um, who fly around in private jets, what gives them the right to, to make so much? Not just inequality, 
but the magnitude of inequality in our society. Now I want to suggest that the CEOs who make this kind of, let's call it filthy money, i.e. huge amounts of it, are actually a, a subset and a very special type of entrepreneur. They're actually supply-side entrepreneurs. And here's what I mean. When, when, you, when you take Economics 101, they teach you about supply and demand. And what business really does is it supplies demand. So people want food. And so you've got Safeway and Kroger's and they supply food. And you want cars. And so you've got Ford and you've got Chrysler, they supply cars. But that's not actually where the big profits are. The big profits go to guys like Steve Jobs. Why? Because they don't actually supply anyone's demand. Nobody wrote letters to Steve Jobs and go, hey Steve, listen, I got this idea for a phone. You know what? It needs to have apps. It needs to be connected to the internet. It needs to do this. It needs to do that. No. No demand. Steve Jobs thought of it. Before there was a demand for it, he anticipated the demand. Then he didn't just think of it, because lots of us think of great ideas and do nothing about them. He then had to organize making it. He had to take all the risk. By the way, none of the Apple employees take any risk. Because if Apple has a bad quarter, Jobs can't go to them and go, hey, bad quarter, guys, give me half your paychecks back. Employees take no risk. They want a flat fee for what they do, and it's a one-time exchange. The entrepreneur doesn't do that. He gets paid at the end. So the point I'm trying to make is that Steve Jobs thought of the iPhone. He made it. He organized it, and he took all the risk, and he put it on the market before you knew you couldn't live without it. That's the kind of guy who makes a huge pile of dough. But again, in what way has this guy, or any of the other guys, the guy who started Federal Express, the guy who, who came up with the idea of roll-on luggage, we should have thought of it. It was rather simple, but for decades, people would go around lugging suitcases at the airport. Then one guy got the idea of putting little wheels on them. That guy probably made a fortune. But again, it was on the supply side because no one had a demand for it. He thought of it first. Now, my point is, again, how are any of these guys, any of them, depriving you or me of our fair share? Isn't it true that in every single case, you had to get out of your car, get out of your house, go to the store, line up at Apple, and then go give them money to get your iPhone? And isn't it also true that if the iPhone cost twice as much, you'd still, be, you'd still want to get one? In other words, you would pay far more than you actually do for this product. It's worth more to you than the 200 bucks you paid for it. So at the, at the end of the day, in what respect have you been cheated? You actually haven't. And so what I'm trying to suggest is that a lot of our outrage about the 1% and this and that, I think is fake. I think it's manufactured outrage. And actually it reflects, and human nature is very much like this. There are all kinds of studies about how we use a moral front to disguise the low emotions that actually drive us. So in fact, we're thinking we would like to get our hands on some of that money. How do we do that? Now, it's kind of bad form to be a pickpocket. Uh, and it's, it kind of lacks moral power to say, you have more money than I do. Do you mind if I reach into your wallet and take some of it? It sounds much better to go, you're exploiting the people. You're an evil capitalist. You're a member of the hated 1%. So the, in, in some senses, there's an effort here to, to create a morality that I don't even see exists. Now, to be fair, there have been sophisticated arguments made to defend um, progressive economic justice. The most sophisticated, in my view, is the argument of Marx. And Marx says, and, and I see a lot of other arguments building on this, Marx's basic idea is that the capitalist supplies capital. Every company is divided into capitalists and labor. And the capitalist supplies money. And Marx agrees. He says, you know, money deserves a return. But the return is no more than the rate of interest. So if you put your money in the bank, you'll get 3%. So if someone is putting up capital for a business, pay the guy 3%. And then businesses have other costs. You have to rent facilities, and you need equipment, and you need to pay, pay workers. 
And all of that is called the cost of doing business. But now Marx says, I notice that when businessmen sell a product, they don't just add up all the cost and charge that much. They charge as much as they can get away with. They charge as much as the market will bear. And so the money comes in, which is more than the cost of the business. There's a gap between what came in and what went out. Marx calls that surplus value. We call it profit. And Marx asks a very sophisticated question, who gets that? Now, Marx's whole assumption is that that belongs to the workers. It belongs to society. It doesn't belong to the capitalist. Why? Because the capitalist only supplied capital, and we already paid him. But as I just tried to show you a minute ago, Marx is actually, in my view, totally wrong. Because, in fact, capitalists don't typically supply capital. That's the one thing they don't supply. You think Steve Jobs put up his own money to, to make the iPhone? No, he went to a bank. He went to a venture capital firm. The real contribution of Jobs had far more to do with the idea for the business, the organization of the business, the assumption of risk, and Marx ignores all of that. He assumes that the workers made the product 100%, and that to me, well, I mean, I don't blame Marx a whole bunch because he didn't really work a day in his life. He was funded by Engels, <laughs> and Engels inherited his money. I mean, this is basically, these are basically the hundred year ago versions of Bernie Sanders.